When is it half a day? Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for the slight delay in the start of this uh, budget hearing. On behalf of, it will be on the Guam Department of Youth Affairs. On behalf of Speaker Benjamin J.F. Cruz, I want to thank everyone for your presence here today. As we continue the budget process of fiscal year 2019, we face overwhelming challenges due to the impacts of the Tax, cut, tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 has and will continue to have on the government of Guam's revenue stream. Given such austere times, the Speaker found it prudent that the Committee on Appropriations have a different tone and approach to the budget hearings. The continued implication that past patterns of appropriation levels will no longer be taken as a given. Prior to this hearing, speakers sent a letter to each agency present today asking that you provide testimony answering specific questions relative to your agency's missions, how you measure the achievement of your missions, and other relevant matters. In prior fiscal years, the committee had taken an incremental budget approach and had requested your agency to justify any additional funding above your existing funding level. For this fiscal year, Speaker is engaging in a zero-based budgeting approach, which does not start with the prior fiscal year's funding level to justify next fiscal year's funding level. Rather, we take a deeper look into each agency's budgets from the ground up. Given the likelihood of decreased revenues from which to fund government services for our people, we must take a closer look at each and every agency of this government and not be bound by what we have always provided in the past. Some may have Googled ZBB, zero-based budgeting, and found that there is no true consensus in which ZBB is operationalized. I'll reiterate for the speaker, as he wanted to clarify to everyone, that the ZBB approach the committee intends on taking is more of a shift in mindset, and as we continue this budget process, the public should be aware that what was provided for in the past is not what the committee will be solely basing decisions on for the future. The committee is doing everything it can to show the people of Guam that we are committing to a ground-up approach because the current fiscal environment calls for it. With that said, we do have the members and the representatives and the management team of the Department of Youth Affairs here. So, Mr. Director, if I can ask you to identify yourself, everyone who has joined you at the table, and then you can proceed with your testimony on the fiscal year 2019 budget for the Department of Youth Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With me here this afternoon is the uh, Deputy Director of the Department of Youth Affairs, Ms. Grisanda calvo Uggen. Uh, the Superintendent of the Department of Youth Affairs, uh, the Correctional Facility, Mr. David Afison, and uh, the ASO is Ms. Jeanette uh, Tovis. To the far right is Ms. Corrine uh, Tyron, who oversees the resource centers, and Ms. Grace Titano, who is the youth uh, development administrator. To the far right, uh, left, I'm sorry, is Ms. Uh, Rebecca Respicio, uh, and uh, directly behind her is Mr. Greg Calv uh, Artero. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, in the absence of Mr. Speaker, and members of the 34th Guam Legislature. My name is Peter Alexis Ada, Director of the Department of Youth Affairs and I am deeply honored to come before your committee to justify the needs, operation, and challenges of the department. We were given a budget ceiling of $5,907,388, plus an additional of $84,425 under the Healthy Future Funds. That amount combined, Senators, we can survive and operate come October 1, 2018 to September 30, 2019. We only have two federal grants 
consolidated into one. And that expenditure is specific to prevention and nothing else. Every division head, the administrator, was given the opportunity to review the division's operating budget. They all have had a, a, the understand, a thorough understanding of what is to be presented here this afternoon. We are all aware that we will never be able to get all the monies we need but we can work within the confines of our budget ceiling. We are anticipating a 300,000 lapsed funds, and this lapsed fund comes from the Jobs Act and the tax cut of, uh, from 20, uh, 2018. The Youth Correctional Facility is the main reason why DYA exist. The others support its mission. Unlike other departments and agencies, we are at 24-7 operation and we are prepared to accept clients who may be detained by GPD and other, and other causes and other main mission is to ensure the safety of every child detained until guidance is issued by the Superior Court of Guam and in a few cases by the Office of the Attorney General. This division's budget, if you will notice in, uh, if you will notice in the budget, there are a number of positions identified but not funded. And I am ready to answer as to why this is a position showing a zero funding. The Youth Correctional Facility's budget, I'd like to make a correction in that, three million, four, uh, three million, three hundred fourteen thousand seven hundred ninety-seven, and the superintendent of the, that facility, that correctional side, is here to answer any and all questions relative to his division. This division has a total of 47 youth service workers. Six are on medical profile and are currently being utilized in various areas in the department based on their doctor's certification. On the issue of hazardous pay, we are current with the exception of eight weeks that has not been paid, or we're working on them. Night differential pay, uniform pay are current. We are doing our best to meet the requirements of the law. To give you an example, there is a standard shoe requirement to be used by all youth correctional, uh, youth service workers. And each of those shoe can cost anywhere between $75 to $125, in addition to the $54 for their pants and $30 for their shirts. In the past, the officers were given $150 for the entire uniform. Last year, we increased that allowance to $275. Senators, as of 1 p.m. this afternoon, I am proud to report to you, we only have 20 clients confined. That is the lowest we have had on record. It is impossible to have the youth correctional workers meet to discuss issues related to their jobs when their days are off. As you are aware, whenever you call an employee to work, you do have to pay for that employee on the time they are off. The youth service workers would need to call a meeting on various issues. We have had, a, uh, we may have a minimum of two meetings per year, 
and in some cases it may even go as much as three. It is still considered overtime pay. Plus these employees who call, plus the employees that will call in sick and would be required to call for an employee who is off to come in and cover for the shortage. Each shift requires a total of nine to 12 employees depending on the shift and the time. Then there's the Youth Development Division, who are the social workers at three resource centers, which are very effective. This division's budget is $1,239,542. I would be remiss not to mention that the judiciary of Guam has helped us with the psychologist as well as the individual and family therapist. We also get help from DOE to provide education for those that are confined. Senators, let me say that this past two years, we graduated four students who would have and have uh, withdrawn from school, but we worked on them to bring them back. And I'm proud to report to you that three of them are out in the community already, seeking higher education and some employment, and one of them is confined to DOC pending release. I am sure you will soon be asking, what plans do we have with the Talofofo property, which was once the cottage home, and we are ready to answer those questions. We are currently working with BBMR to look into DOI funding for the purchase of a new cottage home adjacent to the current DYA facility, which is occupied by authorization from the OJJDP for the rental until September 30 of this year. We are currently working with BBMR to consider DOI funding for such purchase and to include the much needed administration building, which is 42 years old now. Our communication with BBMR is doing very, very well. There are three resource centers one in Dedido, one in Mangilao, and the other in Agat. The clients being served here are those referred by the Superior Court and often called after, and those called after care. We also serve the community, availing them the use of the computers to help them with their uh, homework, school assignments, and deferring them off the streets. We also service the students with special needs in the community and the community as a whole. This past couple of months, we have gone out to the community for the community outreach program, and the most recent one was this past weekend in Agate. We do plan to reach every village in the next couple of months to come through the with the coordination and collaboration with the village mayors. DYA's prevention unit. This unit comprises of a program coordinator under the Division of Youth Development, but currently assigned to the director's office. This unit's main function is to ensure the prevention method methods are taken by reaching out to the youths of our island and empowering them to make positive choices. The prevention unit is also in charge of overseeing federal grants received from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, focusing on in, uh, ensuring full compliance to the uh, JJDP Act. There are two full-time employees. One is a program 
coordinator three and the other is a program coordinator one doing the work of a PC2. Currently, the department only receives federal funds from OJJDP in the amount of $75,000 a year. This division oversees several programs, CHANSA, SCORE, Island Leadership Day, and as I said earlier, and I hope that this leg legislature will be able to fund for the future summer youth employment. As I said earlier, that I, we hope to be able to recruit a new program coordinator to assist in parenting skills. We have discovered that many of the clients have identified the problem as being at home for a variety of reasons. Vocational training section, which is also our ASO, who is our financial office for the operation of the department. Senators, uh, I have attached toward the back side of the pages here a, a scenario of what uh, each of these divisions uh, entail. We also feed the children, the clients, three times a day, seven days a week. Mr. Chairman, over the past couple of months, upon hearing of a budget cut and anticipating even more, come, 20, uh, come fiscal year 19, I've initiated a number of cost-cutting measures because the numbers of our clients have decreased this past year and a half, and we are able to shut down one unit to save power temporarily. Just to show you the exact amount, it's 1000 just for power, $1,300. We only turn on the hot water heaters an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening for the kids to shower. At the resource centers, we have extended the operational hours to 6 o'clock, but because of the budget cuts, we, were, we had to move it back to regular hours, shutting off at 5 o'clock. We've instructed all divisions to not use their air conditioner two hours in the morning and shutting them down an hour before quitting time just to save every penny we can get our hands to. Mr. Chairman and Senators, I think I've given you a pretty good picture of how DYA operates. And we affirm that we will be able to meet option one, budget of five million $907,388 plus the $84,425 from the Healthy, Healthy Future Fund. All of the division heads have joined me here, Mr. Chairman, to answer any and all questions relative to the uh, FY19 budget. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and be assured that the clients confined to DYA are in safe hands. Thank you very much, uh, Director Ada, for your presentation, and thank you also for uh, making sure that your management team is, are here to, and supervisors are here to be able to respond to any questions that members of the committee have. I have a, a few questions that have been uh, identified by Speaker Cruz, the chairman, and I'm going to go ahead and, and begin with those lines of questions. The first one is, can the Department of Youth Affairs operate at its current level if it received funding under option two budget request? I'm glad, Senator, that you asked that question because that was a big question for us too. When we were breaking this down by category, option two was something I really didn't even want to look at. We will have to close, uh, uh, use utilities to cut water, 
the only thing that we're going to have to pay to continue operation will be keeping the uh, YCF operation on. It, it's just not going to work. Option two. Option one gave us a little breather. Okay, next question is under option two, the DYA budget request excludes nearly all of the contractual service requests that are found under option one, with the exception of the copier lease at $13,419, an individual marriage family therapist for risk and needs assessment at $65,000. The contractual services not funded under option two include active directory service for GGWA and domain, air conditioner, refrigeration maintenance, repair, aluminum accordion typhoon shutters, building repair services, small engine repairs, vehicle repairs, dispatch radio services, generator, culinary permits, GMH client billing, and nursing services. Can DYA operate without these contractual services funded as requested in option two? As I said, and I'm glad that you brought those up because I was looking for one particular word, nursing services. No, we cannot. But I, to give you a better, more detail to your question, I'd like to defer to our ASO who can be very, much more specific. Please identify yourself for the record. That's and Jeanette uh, Tovis. No, only for, for the recording purposes, that's why. Hey, I'm Jeanette Tovis. I'm the Administrative Services Officer for DYA. Basically, when they presented us with the two options, BBMR, um, we did the best we can to submit a some semblance of a budget. So... Without, I mean, if you look at it, we were cut like uh, close to 720,000. So our operations itself is like 200,000. So if you have to cut more than 200,000, it really eats into our, our warm bodies. And this is already at a, um, a very minimal staffing level. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Ms. Tovis. Next question is, under option two, the DYA budget request excludes all supplies requests. This includes supplies requests such as administration, automotive, culinary, cottage homes, janitorial, cleaning, etc. supplies, cooking gas, medication and medical supplies, youth correction, food commodities, and non-food supplies. Can DYA operate without these supplies funded as requested in option two? Um, I'll answer your question this way. Please. I hate to tell the parents, bring in your own toilet tissue. <laughs> um, even asking them sometimes to bring in toothbrush, they, wouldn't, they can't do it. Uh, so the answer again is no. Uh, the other, the other options that we were looking at was to cut in uh, a couple of hours under the fam uh, individual and family uh, therapist. We were also looking at uh, reducing the hours of the psychologist, whom we have been getting help from the, from the uh, uh, judiciary. Uh, again, we might as well close up the shop and let the kids go if we're going to go with option two. Okay, just asking the, uh, the chairman's <laughs> questions. Uh, question number four, under option two, the DYA budget request excludes all equipment requests. This includes equipment requests such as AC replacement, computer upgrades, antivirus licenses, dryer replacements, microwave refrigerators, power regular, UPS, television walk-in chiller and washer replacement. The question is, can DYA operate without this equipment funded as requested in option two? Okay. Um, that question can be answered best by simply saying, we wash every day. Every day. Uh, we 
try as much as possible with our children or with our kids to try to ask them to uh, kind of take care of their, their you know, their uh, shirts. But uh, it's still, these kids do have to wash them, their, their clothing. And more so, Sen Senator, we train these kids. Many of them have never been trained how to wash. That's our job. We have, we have our officers who are training them. At the, res at the cottage home, we make sure that those kids are taught life skills. The ones inside the facility, under the youth correctional facility, they might be in one, two, three days. Some could be there for a couple of weeks. Some could be a couple of months. I have three right now that are in for a couple of months. So, as I said, as of one o'clock this afternoon, we have 20 clients only. In the past, before my time coming on board, as deputy director, I have heard stories that has gone as high as 120. Thank you, uh, Director Ada. The uh, other question is, in the current staffing pattern for fiscal year 2018 as submitted by DYA, there is approximately, or there are approximately seven funded vacant positions that have not been filled. Mm -hmm. In the fiscal year 19 DYA budget request, six funded vacant positions are being requested. Given that DYA has been able to operate without these positions being filled in fiscal year 2018, can DYA continue to have these positions unfilled in fiscal year 19? Thank you for that question, and I've been waiting for that. Um, Senator, as I said that, uh, and Mr. Feist is right here to verify the statement, that when we gave them the opportunity to take a look at their budget, we, they, they, he needed to kind of assess what are the needs of the department as a whole. How can he survive with what he has and yet he needs to, he may need a van to transport these kids. He may need um, uh, some staff. What we have done in order to show our good effort that we are willing to cooperate and cut down costs, we've gone as, as much as hiring two LTAs because eight of my staff of my law enforcement officers are either on military deployment, and I think uh, that's uh, six of them, and then two of them are I'm waiting, I'm anticipating to go on a, a year's leave. I need to have somebody cover those. As I said, the average, uh, the average shift, daytime, I need 12 staff. In the evenings, I can survive with nine comfortably, but the minute one gets sick, we need to call in a buffer. Okay, some additional questions. Uh, have you had any retirees in fiscal year 18, or do you anticipate any retirees before the conclusion of the term? Or the yes, I do. I have, I don't recall having anybody in 18. Right. Two are in oh, oh, that's right. Um, that's right. Two are in progress to retire in uh, September 30. Okay. And uh, those positions, we will be requesting to fill those positions come fiscal year 2019. Okay. In fiscal year 2018, how many new hires have you brought in? No, he's asking about uh, 2018. 2018. 2018. Fiscal year 2018. How many new hires? Have been changed? I don't know because. Sheriff. Sure. Sure. And the two others. Her. Sheriff sure. sure. I think four. Okay, thank you, Director Ada, and thank you, uh, Ms. Tovis. The Oversight Chair, Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and yes, thank you to Director Ada and to our deputy, um, and just the entire team at, at DYA. I think, first off, 
looking at option one and versus option two, it really did have me very concerned because it, given what we came into in the beginning of this term, even option one would have definitely been a stretch. But I really want to thank you so much for your hard work and for your dedication and for working with your stakeholders like the judiciary and DOE and others to really get your numbers down. And I think the fact that we have 20 clients today, which is a, is a record, it's, it's tremendous. And, and it also goes to, I mean, I think a lot of people, when they think about the Department of Youth Affairs, all they're thinking about is a youth correctional facility. But your team has really placed a lot of emphasis on the resource centers, on doing things to really promote our kids. I, I know that my, my colleagues and myself, you know, we each had a, a partner for Island Leadership Day, and that was really tremendous. And so you're really showing another side of DYA and really trying to promote the real positive aspects. And, and I know we had a conversation earlier today about this, but um, trying to get additional support to offer training for our parental training and ensure that when these kids end up going home that we're not going to have these issues with recidivism and I think you know some of the other challenges that we're having at DOC and other places throughout our government. So I really want to applaud you for, for a job very well done. Um, Mr. Atta, at your confirmation hearing earlier in the term, you, um, you showed us some images of the DYA facility in total, um, the administration building, as well as the actual uh, youth correctional facility. And I wanted to ask you if this budget reflects um, some of the maintenance, the required maintenance to the facility, and what additional kinds of funding are you going to be looking towards to try to address some of those facility issues? Uh, Senator, uh, I think you had come by to visit the facility, I think you saw it. Jeanette's office is uh, on the ceiling. It's taped with plastic. So when it rains, Jeanette gets up on top of her table and pulls it down so that the water can come down and then she tapes it back up. I did not realize in the conference room that the, uh, the ceiling was painted but not realizing that it's, what they were painting over was the tape that was covering the rain, because the water that would have sipped. Now, no, that is not included in this budget, because we are hoping and we are communicating uh, expeditiously with the BBMR uh, to utilize the DOI funding because 87 to 91% of our clients are from the Federated States of Micronesia. So that's a DOI Compact Impact Funding? Yes. Correct? Okay, thank you. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about reducing the amount of youth entering our correctional facility and, and you had worked to reduce the amount of youth entering the family court by 10% reducing youth entering the correctional facilities by 5% and you know the overall goal of reducing recidivism also by 5%. I wanted to talk with you a little bit about your strategies to accomplish this goal and I wanted to talk to you about the resource centers. If you could give us um, maybe a snapshot of how many families, how many students have used the resource centers, all three of them, in the last year or so. I think I would rather, with your permission, give it to the lady who is the well-versed, uh, Corinne uh, Tyron, who can give you the specs to your question. Um, good afternoon. I'm, my name is actually Corrine Bendicho. Well, just for I the say? record, my my um, my my maiden name was Tyron. So just for the record, <laughs> that was her maiden name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, though. Um, so in 2017, uh, we have like a breakdown of uh, participants that uh, we service throughout the island at our three sites um, for the. Summer Literacy and Math programs, we had a total of 56 in 2017. 
Uh, community kids program, we have a total of 653. <clears throat> um, for the computer labs and tutoring, uh, we have usage of 3,892 in 2017. Um, I just want to mention that in 2016, that was double, but the last, the last time we purchased computers was back in 2010. So some of the computers have since broken down. And that was the last time that we actually bought new computers for our centers that service the island children that come in off the streets to try and do projects for... Are you able to um, accept any donations from maybe private sector? Um... Yes, Senator, we are. And we actually did, when we initially opened back at... Uh, 2008 at Haza down at Agate. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our businesses, um, our business owners up the street, he actually donated the first set of computers in 2008. So we do really utilize as much as possible all our uh, community partners and resources. And so if somebody's watching right now and they would, you know, they're interested Almost in definitely. donating, how can they contact you? Um, they can just reach us at our, our director's office, 735-5010, and they would gladly uh, patch us patch them through to myself or Ms. Grace Titan, our administrator. May I just add to that, the Resource Center in Agate is the very first one, isn't it? Yes, it is. And um, just to kind of give you a visual uh, on, on its flux, uh, Mount Carmel gets out, the kids go straight over there to the Resource Center to help do their homework. Then the elementary school, at the, just about the same time, come right up, they also use that. Then you have Ocean View coming out 20 minutes later, they also utilize. Then half an hour later, you have Southern High School coming in. So we are in communication right now with uh, Gura to expand uh, that facility because it's already getting too small. And just to add to what our director has stated, Back in 2008, when Haza was first built and it was the first, it was actually kind of our test project. And we didn't realize the overwhelming uh, numbers that would, you know, we would have from families throughout. And if you, if you understand, that was the first center built. So we were getting families from other uh, districts as well coming over whenever there was a game at the gym. So the, the spot we picked to build using uh, GRUF funding was actually an ideal spot, and that's the reason uh, we've been in communication to try and expand on that particular project. But since then, um, later in 2008, we also built our um, Lagu site, which is directly across the uh, Maria Ujoa Elementary in the north. And then a couple years later, um, we built Cutten. And that was because of all the numbers we were obtaining through statistics, showing that a lot of the families and uh, at-risk children and you are actually utilizing our services that we uh, offer throughout throughout the island and and we do not just confine ourselves to within those centers but we actually do outreach so we go out and try and uh, um, meet with our community stakeholders and our uh, families out there so they know that we're there we're, vi right. we're visible within the communities thank you so much <clears throat> You're welcome. Um, mr. director on not sure which page this is. Maybe it's the second or third page of your um, of your statement. You mentioned that in the youth correctional facilities budget, there are a number of positions that are listed, but they're indicated um, with zero dollars in funding. So, if you could give us an explanation oh, sure. of that. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said earlier, that w what we did here was we had to look at the overall picture. And the superintendent, Mr. Afaisen here, uh, was the one who made the recommendation. We have to look at other needs of the department because we exist for his division. That's why, why, that's why we're there. And we need to supplement his needs. And he was able to say, can you not remove the position but a zero the funding for in case later we can always go back and fill that position again. But when, if we completely remove it, it's going to be a dead duck before we ever fill it again. So that's why we're going to recommend again 
that leave the identified position but zero the funding. And I think there's only about five positions. Thank you. Actually, Mr. Faison, while we're on that, the last time I visited DYA, um, there were just a handful of uh, female clients. So I wanted to ask you what your ratio is right now in terms of male to female clients or how many female clients you have. Good afternoon, Senators. This is Masi. And at this time, our numbers have tremendously have gone down in regards to be gender specific. Uh, right now, we only have two females under our custody of the 20 actual clients that's legally and physically under our care within youth correction. So DOSA at this time under our custody. Thank you. I'd also like to ask you um, about working with some of the stakeholders in the community in the event of an emergency where you might need to evacuate your facility. Can you talk to me a little bit about what that if you have a SOP for that? Yes, we've come up with a plan already, and this is a draft that we're working, it's a work in progress. We're working hand in hand directly also with our resource centers. And this is what we like to also keep uh, as a huge asset, where we have Lago, which is a huge uh, up in Dededo, we've seen that. And we also have Katan, which is also within, within less than uh, five minutes away. So if any type of requirements, whether it's the weather, whether it's any type of situation that has us move any clients, we'd be able to move them directly to our, within our sites, within our department, to just be as efficient and just be as safe as well. And the same, whether it's logistic or infrastructure, will still be incorporated at the same time. Thank you. I'd also like to ask just a quick update on any um, escapes in the last few weeks or months. Yeah, that I remember the last one was, was when I was a deputy director. Okay. Uh, that was about 2016, uh, two kids. Now, there's a difference between escape and a walkout at the cottage home. It's a walkout because there's no, there's no fencing. They walk out free inside the facility. Now, that's an escape. Thank you, Mr. Director. Also, just to wrap up, um, towards the end of your, your testimony, you indicated in salaries there's a very slight decrease, less than a 1% in increase in salary. But I don't see listed here is um, any funding for employee training. And so I wanted to ask you if you are, what your plan is for training, if you have funds set aside for training, or if you're able to do some of this training online for free, or um, I just wanted to ask you about your training plan for your employees. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Afais, that's why we have inside our budget under OT is also to include those uh, trainings and the meetings that we often uh, require. Uh, now, Jeanette can probably answer that for the other divisions, for YC, uh, excuse me, for uh, youth development and uh, uh, prevention. Uh, uh, will you be, sorry, Senator, uh, would you be talking about uh, like the post requirements and such, or I just in general staff development? In general staff development. Well, we pretty much um, take care of issues on an as-needed basis. So we do have, however, in an annual social worker, um, what is it called, Karina, I'm sorry, is it national? So we are able to um, redirect some of our funding under contractual category to let that happen. So it's not a very large amount. Uh, they normally send, the youth development di uh, division normally sends like two or three, and that's at maybe 250 to $500 a, uh, a person, depending on their membership, non-member or member. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Lee. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank you for the hard work that you do for our children, especially those at risk. Um, congratulations to graduating those four students. Um, that, is a, that is a tremendous achievement because um, you're really shaping and molding their lives and you're making a difference. And, and, and every life counts. 
And so even if it was just one, that is still a great accomplishment in its own, so thank you for that. Um, I do have um, some questions. Um, Mr. Director, in your testimony, you said that you have only two federal grants that you consolidated into one. Um, but I did not catch the dollar amount of the federal grants. Could you share that with us? Okay. Um, because I don't want to confuse sure. or mislead, may yeah. I just refer you to the individual who is course, the expert yes. of this? Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Rispicio. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, I am Rebecca Rispicio. <laughs> Not married. That's not your maiden name. <laughs> um, you know, just to clarify, in, in his testimony, he did say that we only receive federal fundings from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. We did use to receive multi um, funding from them to include the enforcement of underage drinking laws, but Congress no longer funds that. Um, so we really do just get Title II formula grant, which really focuses on compliance of the four core requirements within our facility. And so um, I'll just um, add a little bit to that. Um, we, all are, we are also diligently working towards becoming PREA compliant. We don't necessarily have a grant specific to the Prison Rape Elimination Act because that is something we're mandated to become into compliance by 2020. Um, so we are working towards that. A lot of it is in line with the post requirements locally. You know, ultimately it's about the safety of the kids that are incarcerated. Um, we do use online training. Um, we have been, the officers have been taking Relias online training, which really helps them to better understand PREA law requirements. Um, and then recently, because that has also um, ended, the contract has ended for that, we're going to be moving into the National Institute of Corrections. Uh, it's a national PREA resource online training. So our, uh, we'll be introducing that to the officers as well to uh, continue their training online. Um, but it really is only, with regards to the formula grant, it's only approximately $75,000 annually, for which we just submitted our FY18 application that included a three-year state plan. So it's a three-year state plan of 75000 And again, it's not to fund personnel. Unfortunately, we can't fund construction. Uh, we did get approval to use that money for the rental of our cottage homes facility, but that's very temporary. That is going to end on September 30. We only got approval for about 10 months of rental um, with the understanding that we were going to diligently work towards finding that funding to purchase that house. Mm -hmm. um, the house is, you were there at the opening senator and the house is just right outside the facility. So operations wise, personnel wise, it is going to save the government of Guam a lot of money in the long run versus the old cottage homes facility in Telefofo, which needs repairs of, gosh, is it close to $500,000? And that's only to repair it just enough that doesn't include how much it costs to travel back and forth for the food for the kids, the the personnel, the school, the teachers that have to go all the way to Telefofo. This house just happened to be at the market at the perfect time. And I'll also indicate that part of our OJJDP funding requirements for the four core requirements requires that we separate status offenders with non-status offenders. So when Cottage Homes mm -hmm. and Telefofo went down, we were at we were very close to becoming non-compliant because the status offenders, which are the non-criminal cases, had to find shelter within our youth correctional facility. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we had to ensure that they weren't behind locked doors. Mm -hmm. So that was just a temporary band-aid. The house makes sense. And it's been working. It's just we're having to find the funding to actually purchase. Okay. Uh, let me just add to that. Had we still been in Telefofo? And as of this morning, we have three in cottage home. Can you picture having to go, the, the, the teachers to go up there to teach for three kids, mm -hmm. plus the cooks mm -hmm. have to have, deliver the food three times a day up to Tarafua? It's cheaper to get them in, down, over in, in Mangila. And the cottage home that you're looking to purchase is at... Um what, what village is this? It's right outside our gate. It's oh, okay. the first house okay. on the right. Oh, and yes, yes, um, yes. because we didn't have to worry about residential rezoning or anything, because as long as we have 12 clients and below, um, 
then it doesn't have to, it could just be a residential facility and not a group home. Mm -hmm. So um, with the courts working diligently with DYA, they're very, they're really scrutinizing those remands and they're, they're being a lot more um, better about not remanding just any client or any kid um, to DYA. So we've had an average of, gosh, like two, three, or four Cottage Homes clients, and we're very confident that with our partnership with the court, it's gonna stay that way. Again, if we happen to go over 12 for any reason in the future, we already have a plan B that we are going to just have to utilize the same area in our correction facility that does not keep them behind a locked door. Okay. So that's a mandate. Right, thank, thank you for that. And then, um, let's see. You mentioned the resource centers, no? And it, the, um, the amount of usage that is done, especially for the computer labs. Do you guys um, avail to any federal programs that perhaps can uh, upgrade or change out some of, some of your computer systems or any, or any of the services that you provide? Um, Are there I, any for you to <clears throat> avail to? I have been in communication with uh, uh, an individual down uh, with the Navy. And that, was that, a, that was quite out. some time ago, and they still haven't come back to me. <laughs> okay, so because GSA does have some refurbished computers, is that what you're looking at? Or? Well, you know, uh, the response that was given to me is, uh, Mr. Etta, yeah, we do have, uh, we have some computers that we're ready to uh, let go, mm -hmm. but uh, they need to be specific as to what, uh, uh, what are the requirements under our, our program. And uh, oftentimes they would say, no, it's not going to work. This, that, this particular uh, 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 program is not going to work with, with that that you need. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping to be able to upgrade our, rather than using uh, an antiquated or an outdated, mm -hmm. uh, it's probably wiser for us to get new ones. Okay. You know, not, not 20 at one time, but if we can get four at a time, uh, eventually, we'll get there. Okay, but it, to our to our credit, to um, Senator, we have actually received computers from um, people or community partners that wanted to give us, and we've actually um, take parts from some to make some work. So that's yeah. the reason some of our uh, labs are still operational, is yeah. because we had to use a mouse from one, and uh, but we we make Cannibalize it work somehow. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay. All right, thank you. You're no, it's very important, these resource centers, because as a teacher, That's correct. we assign homework, and, and they don't have the internet to be able to get these projects done, and so, no, you're helping the students also to develop yeah. themselves. Yeah. At the very We're, least, we do provide the Wi-Fi, so some yeah. of the, the, a lot of the students that come in nowadays, they use phone. Oh, okay. Uh, but at least, so they, it's not unusual to see them hanging around just for Wi-Fi access, <laughs> so that they can do research <laughs> for assignment, right? That's or go realistic. on Facebook, right? Come on, they're yeah. kids. <laughs> or iPads, you know. Uh, so sometimes the kids will sign in just to have access to that. Okay. But they bring their own um, technology. Okay. I should also mention that the Department of Education does provide their teachers uh, with computers. And also that uh, I'm proud to report and let you know that we will be having summer school for the kids. I certainly... Uh, Out of the resource center? I'm sorry? Out of the resource center? No. You said you're having you're no, holding the, summer school. No, in, for those that are inside. Oh, I see. I in see. the client. Yeah. So we're going to have summer school on June 12th. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, rather That's than good. the kids sitting idle doing nothing, we will put them to put something in their head. Yes. Yeah. And then I noticed you have um, um, a request to to hire a maintenance leader. And so I just wanted to know, have, has there been a cost analysis done, whether if you were to contract out your maintenance requirements or your maintenance needs rather than to hire someone permanently in the government system with the benefits and retirement plan and, and so forth and so on that is due to them? Has there been like a cost analysis done? I would that? refer that, that, uh, that question to uh, Jeanette to answer, but I'll answer you this way in simple words. With 17 buildings that we have, can you imagine how much it's going to cost if it's contracted? Let Jeanette further that. Sure. Yes, well, um, all I have to add to that is that um, not only is it um, 
the cost, but the wait for some things to be repaired. So we need them immediately. And some of those are sourced out, mm -hmm. like for the bigger projects that, you know, uh, they're not able to do, like, for example, maybe a roof job or a, what was the most recent one in the correctional side of the house? And, and a replacement of roof, roofing tins, such. So um, it, it's more so the weight that would be the problem, plus the vendors that are out there who can provide the services because we have been having issues uh, with procuring uh, services with vendors that either are not, are no longer um, um, able to provide services to the government of Guam, but or or else they're just not, um, not not necessarily willing. But they're no longer vendors. They're 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 um, they either close down or have not been paid, and they just don't want to provide services. Basically, so. So, so you feel that it is best in the best interest of the government to hire a full-time employee uh, with the, for the duration of a retirement of 20 plus years rather than to contract these services to maintain your buildings? I would say yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. And uh, I just want to ask one more question. The, the physical requirements for the post are coming up for your officers, so I just want to make sure that we're all uh, ready for this and to push it through. Yes, ma'am, we are okay. ready. Let me just uh, add one other thing, if you don't mind. I completely forgot to include it in here. <coughs> if you recall, I had said earlier that uh, there are some imp uh, uh, law enforcement officers who are on medical profile and we have put them out in the resource centers. But because of the deployment of some of our staff, we needed to bring them in to assist. And what we're doing now is we are working with the Department of Labor under the jobs program to assist some of those uh, people that may be seeking employment temp for temporary purposes uh, to assist us over in the resource centers. That's, yeah. that's where we're at right now. Yeah, okay. And, it's good. and we're doing very, very well. Uh, two, I think three have already been completed. We're expecting a few more to be referred. Okay, that's good, because I understand that, you know, there are some mm -hmm. physical requirements to hold your position, uh, essentially also to do what you do as far as um, interacting with the, the youth, your youth clients, and so I just want to make sure well, that, you know, the, your officers are fit and not put at risk, and then also there are some accommodations made for them if they were hindered or hurt or injured on the job. Yeah. And well, so these, uh, uh, these so-called community program aides not only assist them in the resource centers, but also they go out to do home visits. They also okay. do uh, school site uh, uh, monitoring of the kids, yeah. and then they report them to the social work, the assigned social workers. Mm -hmm. But you so, did say that because of some of the deployments that are going on, people that are in the service part time, you'd have to reshuffle them around a bit and bring them back into your main base. No. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Uh, just one follow-on question with regards to the four new hires that you have brought on. Can you mention or highlight the positions that were filled? Because this is going to go back to the staffing pattern that uh, the Committee on Appropriations is reviewing. The former recent hires. Ooh, the position hires. titles. Okay. Uh, the one that I recall was my private secretary. And that and I, she came on board in October. The deputy director came in in I think December, October. Oh, October. And then of course our two uh, uh, recent LTAs. LTAs. What's the position titles? Huh? Position titles. Position so title. So uh, so you also have a, a Jessica Perry. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot. There is one Y, 
uh, YSWA, with Youth Service Worker Assistant. Um, let me see. Uh, Crescinda came in, uh, she's the Deputy Director. Mm -hmm. uh, Crescinda Uggen, is that her? No. Is that her last name? Yeah. Diego, yeah, sure. Diego. Uh, she came in also in October. Position title. I'm sorry? Position title. Sure, position, she was, she was my private secretary. Oh, okay. She was the private secretary So you got a private, private secretary, you have your deputy director. Yeah. And I just hope the, uh, Appropriations is keeping track of this. The two LTAs You have a youth service worker assistant. assistant. So you have two youth service worker assistants. Two LTA youth service workers and one LT, uh, one uh, social uh, youth service worker assistant. Uh, she's just finishing up, I think, her six. No, she already finished her six months, right? She'll be done by July. Okay, she should be done by July with her probationary. So a total of still four positions or five? Five. 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 That would be five. Yes. That's exactly why the question was asked. Uh, okay, so I, I'm sure the Committee of Appropriations has that information. This concludes the uh, budget discussion on Department of Youth Affairs. Thank you very much, folks. Enjoy your day. Thank you, Senator.